Chapter 6, let's open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We love you, Lord. You are indeed a great and an awesome God. We ask, Lord, now as we go to your word, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And Lord, give us ears to hear what your Spirit would say to us tonight. May we learn from the life of Gideon. And may we apply what we learn to our own lives as well. We thank you for the book of Judges. What an awesome book. We thank you that it applies to our lives today, even though written thousands of years ago. Be our teacher. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, before we get into the text, I had something, you know, I like to share. You guys are my family. I get to read your prayer requests. I just want to share a couple things with you guys that were really cool that I just had happen in the last few days. Uh, First of all, last night I was down in Carson on a sales call. Uh, I've been helping out with some of the accounts down there. And the First Baptist Church of Wilmington, where I got saved, has a Wednesday night Bible study. My dad pastored there from 1967 to 1973. I got saved in Mrs. Green's Sunday school class. I was baptized at that church. So I was so determined to go that I sat in the parking lot for three and a half hours from 3.30 to 7, but I used that time to study for tonight, so it was a good time. And then I went to church there, and they haven't changed anything. The pulpit my dad taught from behind, everything's exactly the same. It was like a time warp. felt like I was seven years old again, sitting in the front row watching my dad teach. So that was really a blessing. And then um, a little while back, I ran into a young man who was, we were celebrating Brett moving up to Santa Barbara, and he had, he, we started talking, he's Russian, he asked me if I'd ever, I'd ever been to Perm, which is a city I've been to before, and he told me, he said, you know, were you there in that church plant? I said, I was. And he said, you know what? I got saved when you were there. He said, you came to my English class, and you talked to us about the Lord, and I got saved when you were there. Now he goes to Calvary Godspeed. And he said, didn't you speak to a bunch of neo-Nazis one night at the concert? I go, yeah. He goes, you were sitting at a table with like eight neo-Nazis, and everybody left, and you were still there. I go, yeah. And I, go, and I go, yeah, and by the grace of God, myself and the interpreter, we led several of them to the Lord. And he said, one of those guys is now the pastor of that church. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Can our God do exceedingly abundantly of all we ask or think? Yeah. And it was just a, just a word of encouragement for me. I mean, this was back in, I was there in 2000. That was 18 years ago. Isn't it cool how God does awesome stuff? So praise the Lord. That's good. Well, Judges chapter 6. Um, let's do a little review. We'll pray and we'll dig into the text. So judges, as we've talked about, they're not guys in black robes. They're deliverers. We know that seven times over a 400-year period of time, they're walking with the Lord because God raised up a deliverer. They followed after him. When the deliverer dies, they run right back to the world. And they start serving the false gods of the world. The very things he had warned them about all through Joshua, all through Deuteronomy, that they were going to be tempted when they land. So they're in the land of promise. They're where they're supposed to be. And they're, you know, a picture of the spirit-filled life, but it doesn't mean that the trials don't continue and the temptation doesn't continue to come. And sadly, what continues to happen is that God raises up a, a prophet in the midst of their desperation. They start following the Lord, the prophet dies, and they go right back to their old way of life. In chapter 5, we saw God use a woman to lead them, Deborah, because no men would stand up. If you weren't here the last two weeks, we looked at courageous women of faith, and then last week, walking in victory. And I love that she was willing to stand up when no other men would. And you know, guys, that should never have to happen in our homes or in our marriages or in our families. Our wives shouldn't have to step up because we should. Can we say amen to that? We're called to be the spiritual leaders. Our wives are just as called, called in a different way. And so we need to be accountable. We need to be faithful to God's calling upon our life. So tonight we're going to start another one of those cycles. And we're going to look at a man whose name you're all familiar with, the man by the name of Gideon. And as we look at the life of Gideon, when you think of Gideon, you think of a bunch of really good stuff. Can you say amen to that? When you think of Gideon, it's like people, when I'd go to India, you'd, you'd meet all these guys who changed their names. they get saved, they had Hindu names, and they changed their names, and you go, and sometimes you're like, dude, have you, have you read the Bible about that guy? Like, they just pull a biblical name, and I remember in one of the classes, there was 13 Samsons. And I'm like, yeah, he's in God's Hall of Faith, but... Kind of a mess before that. You might want to study that guy. Well, Gideon, certainly, God uses him mightily. He's in God's hall of faith. But we're going to see tonight that he began as a man of great doubt, a man of great fear, a man who didn't trust God fully. And so I titled the message tonight, if you have your outline, from doubter to deliverer. And you know what? That encourages me. Anybody here ever have doubt? You ever struggle with that in your life? 
Well, guess what? You're not alone. And I'm really glad in the Bible that every one of the people used by God isn't like, you know, just a superstar. You know, you have guys like Daniel without one recorded sin. We know he's a sinner because all men are. But if you looked at Daniel's life, he'd go, I could never be Daniel. But, you know, you look at, I, I could be Samson, I'm going to be a problem. Amen? I mean, God, if God can use Samson, he can use us. Amen? And we're going to see after tonight, if God can use Gideon, he can use us. You know what? A lot of times, we begin with doubt, we begin, begin with struggles, and God brings us through stuff to make us mighty men and women of faith. And we're going to see that example take place tonight. Let's look at the outline, we'll pray and we'll dig in. So I tell the message from doubter to deliverer, Gideon's doubts expressed, he really has four questions for God. And when I read these questions, you're probably going to almost laugh. But we're going to see, these are kind of the questions in the heart of Gideon, and we're going to see that by what he does in this chapter that kind of reflects that. The first question that he has, does God really care about us? And here's the funny part. I know a lot of people who still ask that question now. You know, as a pastor, I get asked those questions. God doesn't care about me. If God cared about me, he... And we're going to see that that's kind of where, if you've ever been there in your own walk, you're going to see that Gideon's kind of there. And we're going to see how God responds to that. Does he care about us? We'll see how he cares about us. Does God know what he's doing? To me, that's blasphemous. Amen? But in a sense, don't people ask that question? Why doesn't God do something? Why does God allow evil people to do evil things? Why does God? And you see that you hear those questions. And when people find out you're a pastor, again, I get that a lot. Oh, you're a pastor? I got questions. Why do evil people and why does God allow? Does God know what he's doing? Yes, he does. Amen? We'll see that tonight. But these are kind of questions that are reflected in Gideon's behavior almost to the point where it seems like he needs answers. Number three, will God take care of me? Can I trust him to take care of me? Um, I was talking to a co-worker yesterday, and tomorrow's his last day with our company, and he called me up to pray with him, and I was praying with him over the phone, and he has confidence. He says, look, I know I've been working here for forever, and I know I'm going to be looking for a job for the first time in a long time, but I know God's going to take care of me, and I say amen to that. And then finally, does God keep his promises? Yes, he does. Amen? Now, these are all questions that we should not have to have, but sometimes they, in a moment of doubt, you may have rattle around in your head, and I pray that tonight, as Gideon gets answers to them, that you'll be encouraged as well. Can we say amen to that? Let's open the prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray now as we go to your word that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Uh, Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you'd give us attentive hearts. Please, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So the previous chapter has just ended. Uh, Deborah, Deborah's song, she sings out about all the things that the Lord has done. We're reminded of, of uh, Sisera. I knew there was a reason why I didn't like that my wife loves to camp so much. And I got another reason not to. Anybody can put up a tent. It's a little ner- makes me a little nervous now after uh, JL, right? But... Now we've come to a whole new deliverer. Here comes a new cycle again. Deborah's now off the scene. And look what it says there in verse 1, looking at from doubt, from doubter to deliverer. What do the children of Israel do as soon as there's no longer some, a, a person, a prophet for them to look to? It says there, then the children of Israel did, what is that word? Evil in the sight of the Lord. They saw God. Did God bring deliverance when they were faced, when they were outnumbered by a, a mighty army? What's the answer? Did God bring rain to, to, to render the chariots ineffective? What's the answer? Did God overcome a huge obstacle for them? Did God raise up someone to encourage them? Did God do a mighty and powerful work? The answer is yes. And as soon as that deliverer is gone, what do they do? They run right back to evil. And the, and the reality is when we're the one who is struggling, we don't question why, but when you see others struggling, you think, what are they thinking? And the reality is this can be all of us from time to time, where we're on fire for God, and then we allow the trials and the difficulties of this life to cause us to take our eyes off of the Lord. One of the reasons that they begin to do evil is they had 40 years of peace. And sometimes... 
We grow complacent when, we're, when everything seems to be good. Can we say amen to that? When there's nothing to be desperate about, there's no reason why I have to fall on my face and cry out to God. Everything seems to be going really well. And if we're not careful, that is a trap. Got money in the bank, everybody's healthy, everything seems to be going well. I don't have to be desperate for God. My, let's all be honest. When, when do you pray in the most desperate way? In the most difficult times? Can we say amen to that? When, when somebody you love, is, is, their health is in danger, when you've lost your job, when one of your kids is wayward, when, when something that is beyond your ability to fix, you're on your face going, Lord, help! But when you're on the cruise ship to heaven and everything seems to be good, you become complacent. They had 40 years of God's hand upon them, 40 years of no bondage, 40 years of God's presence, God's power, God's peace, and because of that, they ceased to be desperate for the Lord. And as soon as the, the judge was gone, the deliverer was gone, what did they do? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they returned to their flesh-driven idolatry, the me, my, and I disease, amen, that we all can struggle with, amen? amen. Me, myself, and I, my three favorite people. The people that are always on my mind, amen? And they go running back to what their flesh wants. Now, does God love them? That's the question tonight. How does God express his love? Someone who's doubting, the first question is, does God really care about us? Yes, he cares about you. And let me tell you one of the ways he shows you that he cares about you. Rest of verse 1. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Wait a minute, I thought you said God cared about them. He let the enemy defeat them. Those who the Lord loves, he disciplines. Amen? Those who the Lord loves, he will do whatever is necessary to draw them back unto himself. Guys, if we're living a sinful and wicked life and God doesn't bring discipline, we may never come home. Can we say amen to that? And it will get worse and worse. And I have people even say that because God will show grace for a period of time. And God's grace is not God's permission to sin. Amen. But there will be people like, well, I've been living this way for a while now. Nothing's happened. It's coming. Either that or you need to get saved because he disciplines his children. Amen. And I'm glad that he disciplines me. How about you? You know, sin is pleasurable for a, a season. But before long, God will chasten and discipline his children. Guys, sin has consequences. God will never allow you, God will never bless your rebellion. Amen? You cannot shake your fist to God for long and live a peaceable life if you're a believer. Can we say amen to that? Sin is pleasurable for a season. If there wasn't some level of fleshly pleasure, we'd never do it. Amen? But it feeds our flesh, and we're drawn away to it, whatever that fleshly thing may be. And so here, the children of Israel have seen the power of God, the presence of God, the victory over the enemy, and now, left to themselves, they return to evil. And so the Lord is going to bring upon them righteous judgment. And often God will use ungodly people to bring about godly judgment just like he brings the children of Midian God will use the government that may be not following God to bring about righteous judgment God will allow things in your life and God will use even the world to bring about righteous judgment those who the Lord loves he disciplines it says in Proverbs 3 11 and 12 my son do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son, just as the father does his son, the son in whom is his delight. So proof number one of his love and concern for Israel and for the children of Israel and for you and I is he disciplines us. He cares enough to discipline us. God is not a permissive parent that just lets you do what you want. He doesn't just give you what you want. By the way, if you just give your kids whatever they want, you are raising a brat. Can we say amen to that? You're raising a, an entitled, entitled, spoiled, rotten little baby who will cry when the election doesn't go their way. 
who will need a coloring book and go sit in a corner because I didn't get what I wanted. You know what? No is an answer. Amen? Amen? And praise God that God doesn't treat us, doesn't just give us what we want, and it's nonsense. The whole name it and claim it, grab it and blab it, believe it and achieve it, word of faith movement that makes commands of God, and anything I tell God, if I believe it enough, he has to give it to me. I'm glad that God loves me enough that that's not true. Amen? And so this false doctrine, and so there's this mentality that if God, you know, if God will give me whatever I want. No, because mostly, most of what I want is sinful. Can we say amen to that? If you just say Cadillac, 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 it'll be in your driveway. You know, Lord, help. Amen? Lord, don't give me anything that's going to take my eyes off of you. So the Lord brings the foreign army. And, and here's, can you imagine, we had 40 years of peace, and we had victory over the enemies, and now all of a sudden the enemy's overrunning us. What happened, God? For the first time, they're going to have to look up. For the first time, they're going to realize they're in trouble. And praise God that he loves us enough. His ultimate purpose for you and I is that we be conformed to his image. You hear me say it all the time. He cares way more about your character than he does your comfort. Amen? Nowhere in the Bible does it say we're supposed to be comfortable. Nowhere. That's why he sends a comforter, because we're going to be uncomfortable. Amen? Chasing is evidence of God's love for his people and hatred for sin. And a perfect holy God wants only his best for us, that we may walk in holy character, that we might be molded into the men and women of God he's called us to be. Obedience to the Lord builds character, but sin destroys character. And God will not and cannot sit idly by and watch his children destroy themselves. It breaks my heart when my kids are outside of God's will. And I want to do everything I can to help them. And I'm an imperfect dad. How much more does your heavenly father want what's best for you? Amen? And so he brings discipline. And it says there, And the hand of the Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves dens and caves and strongholds which are in the mountains. Here's something that happens when you live in rebellion against God. You end up in hiding. You end up having to hide from God. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the first sin ever on the earth, when everything was perfect and holy previous to it, what did they do? They hid from God. Then they covered themselves with fig leaves, remember? And guys, you know what we want to do often when we're caught up in sin? We want to run from God. We want to hide from God. Why? Because when you're in the light of his presence, it shines a bright light on your sin. Can we say amen to that? And one of the things we do when we want to hide, we all want to hide from fellowship. We want to hide from reading our Bible. We want to hide from, uh, you know, being at church and hide from reading the, everything that's godly that will bring conviction. The enemy, just run away from it. We want to be desensitized to our sin and continue in it. And here's what happens. They're in the land flowing with milk and honey. All their enemies, were you know, their enemies were defeated that they had faced. God had brought victory, and now because they chose to sin, they're living in a cave. Guys, the way of the transgressor is hard. Amen? When you disobey God, especially when you're a born-again believer, your life is going to be hard. It's interesting, the Midianites are descendants of Abraham. So these are Abraham's kids fighting with each other. But the Midianites, we know, uh, were walking contrary to the Lord. And they had been sent east to keep them from hassling Isaac and his descendants. And they became enemies of Israel. And guess what? It's those same people today. That same battle is going on in Israel today. Jacob's descendants against you know, Esau's descendants. And the children of Israel made for themselves, they're, they're hiding in dens, they're living in caves. Isn't it interesting? Where does the Taliban live today? Caves in Afghanistan. They're hiding. Guys, I don't want to have to hide from God. How about you? When he comes back, I hope he comes back and he finds me about his business. Can we say amen to that? Lord, I don't want to be in hiding. I don't want to run from your calling upon my life. I want to live in the center of your will, verses 3 through 5. So it was. 
Whenever Israel had sown, Midianites came up, also Amalekites. Amalekites, should they have been dead already? Do you remember when they went into the land? Weren't they supposed to wipe all these folks out? And do you remember that God commanded them? He gave them chapters in Deuteronomy, told them again in Joshua. They went into the land. They let these people live. They let their false gods stay. And guess what? It's all coming back to haunt them now. Look what it says there. The Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. And they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the, the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in the numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number and they would enter the land to destroy it. Imagine if you were living in those days or, or even an analogy today and you go out and you work for an entire planting season. And then you, you tend to, you know, maybe you have 20 acres, enough to feed your, your, you and your extended family for an entire year. And you tend it, and then you get it all prepared, and you're, you're out there through the rainstorms, and you're watching it, and you're pruning it, and you're doing everything that needs to be done. And then on the day that harvest comes, when you're finally going to harvest, all that you've worked so hard for, in comes the enemy, and they just decimate everything that you've done. That's what happens to the children of Israel every year for seven years. Everything they touch, everything they work toward, everything they put their hands to is destroyed by the enemy. By the way, when we sin, isn't that the same result that takes place? Somebody commits adultery. What happens? Everything he's invested in his entire life with his marriage and his children and his character, it's all wiped out by the enemy in a moment. Can we say amen to that? Guys, when we choose to sin, we're inviting in destruction into our lives. We're inviting the tearing down of our character and our relationship with the Lord and the way that the world sees us, the destruction of our integrity. And the children of Israel had done evil in the sight of the Lord, and now here comes the consequences. I thought about putting in in today's vernacular. Imagine if every two weeks on payday, that as they came and put your, their check into your hand, as soon as you grabbed a hold of it, a guy ran through the hall, snapped it out of your hand, and ran out the front door. And he did it every two weeks for seven years. That's exactly what's happening to the children of Israel because they did evil in the sight of God. Guys, the way of the transgressor is hard. If you live in rebellion, your life will be fruitless. Amen? Their lives are bearing no fruit. Why? Because they rebelled against God. Let me tell you something. If there's no fruit in your life, take a look at your walk with the Lord. Because the Bible says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is, amen? And there's, if there's no fruit you got to wonder if there's been salvation, and certainly if there is salvation, you're obviously walking in open rebellion against God. Otherwise, there should be fruit in your life. Can we say amen to that? By your fruit, they will know you. Children of Israel, reaping the... Con now, why is God doing this? Is he just doing it to punish them? Certainly, that's part of it. They're being punished, but what else? He's doing it so they'll cry out to him again. Amen? He's doing it so they'll say, Lord, can I come home, please? Prodigal son, amen. To, to get to a place where they recognize, you know, the way I was living life, not so much. The way I thought was going to be okay, that's not working out. God, I want to put you back where you belong in my life. I want to make you the priority. In Lord, help. And praise God. We pray for people sometimes, and things get worse. And I have people... I had you pray for my son, and it got worse. He's in jail. I don't get it. It's just, we prayed for him. God didn't answer our prayer. Really? Maybe that's exactly what needed to happen to get him looking up. Amen? And so here they are, the children of Israel. This overwhelming foe that we know from the other text, there's 135,000 Midianites plus Amalekites, as we'll see later. They had camels that they used. Uh, camels without number. Uh, have you ever been around camels? First of all, they're the largest of all the unclean animals. They slobber like nobody's business. They smell bad. They're ornery, and they're fast. Hey, Amen. You ever seen anybody on a camel knew how to ride one? Well, guess what? Camels coming in. 
You know, they wiped out the chariots with God on their side. They couldn't overcome the camels without him. Amen? Guys, our God is greater than any foe, but guys, left into ourselves, the way the transgressor's heart. So Israel's sin and rebellion promised pleasure, and instead it resulted in fruitful lives and people that were hungry. Sin always promises pleasure and delivers pain. Amen? Delivers destruction. Oh, come do this. It's okay. Oh, God already forgave you. It's all right. Come, come, come. And you know what? Every time we sin, we're separating ourselves from the Lord. We're breaking fellowship with God. Some, no doubt, are sitting there in rebellion, having all their food stolen from them, being under the bondage of this enemy, going, God doesn't care about us. But just remember why you're there, why they're there. They're there because they rebelled against God and told God they wanted nothing to do with Him. Because they were shaking their fists at God. And actually, it's because the Lord loves them that He's allowing them to go through this so that they will cry out to Him yet again. Because the only thing that really matters is where are we at with the Lord. Amen? And if a big promotion is going to take me away from God, I don't want it. If, if a, a terminal illness, illness is going to draw me closer to God, then bring it. That's an eternal perspective that the world doesn't have. Amen? And this is the exhortation. As they're saying, does God care about us? He cares about us enough to discipline us. Verse 6, so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel. What does it say? Cried out to the Lord. The end result is worth all the difficulty they had to go through. Can we say amen to that? Whatever needs to happen to get us back here, it's worth it. Whatever needs to happen in the lives of our children, our grandchildren, other people in our families that are away from the Lord, Lord, do whatever you got to do to get them right back here. Amen? And whatever it is, it's worth it. Children of Israel cried out to the Lord, brought to the end of themselves by divine uh, discipline, by sin's consequences, by poverty and bondage. They had nowhere else to turn. They put their eyes back on the Lord. You know what? I'm praying that for the United States. God, do whatever you got to do to get our eyes back on you. If we need to have, if the stock market needs to fall to nothing, if we need to have, I don't care, I don't care whatever, do whatever you got to do, God, to get, us, get our eyes back. Oh, Pastor Dave, I don't like that. I don't want my house to go down in value. I don't want to lose my 401k. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to, I don't want to, Lord, do whatever it takes to get our eyes back on you. Can we say amen to that? Lord, help. Unless our suffering leads to repentance, it accomplishes nothing that lasts. Unless our repentance is evidence of a Holy Spirit desire to turn from sin, not just escape from pain, repentance is only remorse. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry I got caught. That's not repentance. Repentance is, Lord, forgive me. I'm walking away from that. I'm surrendering my life to you again. Too often, people get caught, and I'm so sorry I got caught, and you let them go, and they do it again the next day because they've never repented. Amen? And God knows if you're just sorry you got caught or if you're really repentant. Amen? So, number point number one there, of God, does God really care? He cares enough to discipline us. He cares enough to give us his word. Look at verse 7 through 10. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you. And I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. God reminds them by his prophet, someone who speaks truth for them, you're in bondage now, but you know what? I got you out of bondage in Egypt. You were there 400 years. I've delivered you out of bondage from every enemy that's ever come along. You know what? I, because I love you. And the sad part is, with everything that I've done for you, all the power I've exhibited in front of you, you still turn your back on me. God is reminding them. And too often for us, I believe that we get overwhelmed in our circumstances because we're, we're quick to forget all that God has done for us. Can we say amen to that? people say to me all the time, I don't believe God really heals. I just don't believe it. You know, he could, but he doesn't. Why, why would you pray for healing? God doesn't heal people. 
How many people in this room have ever been healed by the Lord before in a supernatural way? I have. You can tell me all day long. I had a tumor behind my cheekbone when I was a sophomore in high school. They were going to have to cut out my cheekbone to pull all the tumor out. I'd seen three specialists, three doctors, x-rays. The day I was supposed to go in before surgery, they laid hands on me and prayed for me in front of the church, anointed my head with oil. I was, I was in the gown to go in for the surgery. My mom said, do one more x-ray. They said, we've already got three. Do one more. I'll pay for it. Guess what? Gone. God did it. Amen? And we can go around the room. And many, many other times you see the power and the presence of God. And guys, it's when we cry out to him and when we, when we see God move, we should remember, you know what? I know God can heal because I've seen him do it. Can we say amen to that? And we, and we need to be reminded of all that God has done. Be reminded how he delivered people. We've seen people addicted to drugs get saved. We've seen people struggling uh, with finding whatever. We've seen God restore marriages that have fallen apart. Guys, when we've seen God do it, we know God can do it again. And he's reminding them, you're worried about the Midianites? I, I, I got you free from Egypt. Amen? Much mightier army than these guys. The most mighty army on the planet. And I, I got them giving you stuff on the way out. Amen? Take this. And then when they change, I parted the Red Sea. Guys, I spoke from the mount. Guys, we need to remember all that God has done. And that's why we need to read the book and not wait for the movie. Because when we read this, we're reminded of all that God has done. Amen? And he's reminding them again. Because we begin to doubt when we forget God's word. Guys, I love the Bible. The Bible rocks. It truly does. And it is the rock upon which we stand. It's our, our, you know, a picture of our Savior. And the purpose of chastening is to make God's children willing to listen to God's word. Guys, we spank our kids, but we admonish and heed that they would listen to what we have to say. When my kids grew up, we had the Board of Education. Go get the board. Oh, no. Go wait in the laundry room. Oh, that was a long walk. Then you leave them in there for a while. That's torture. He's coming. And every time I'd give him a swat before I did, I'd say, why are we doing this? And I'd give him a swat and I'd talk to him. Guys, why do we, those who the Lord loves, he disciplines. Guys, the Lord loves us enough to allow us to go through difficulty, bring difficulty upon us when we live outside of his will. We spank our kids if we love them and God disciplines us because he loves us. And the next time you start to question whether or not God really cares about you. Just remember all he's done for you. Amen? You know where that starts? Right here. At the cross. Amen? When you remember what God has done for you. Enough to chasten, to discipline, enough to send a prophet, to send his word. Point number three there. He cares enough to come down to us personally. I love this. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was in Orphrah which belonged to Joash, the Abizite, while his son Gibeon threshed wheat in the rind press in order to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, who is that? It's Jesus. Every time. It doesn't say an angel. It says the angel. Angel's messenger. The angel of the Lord. So not only does he send a prophet, now Jesus shows up. And he's sitting under a tree, waiting upon them. And now Gideon is in a wine press. They have this, uh, I forget what they call it in Israel. It's like Bible land or something like that. And it's really pretty cool. Uh, when you go there, you go, through, go around in a big circle, and they have all these things that are talked about in the Bible that you don't really, they have an ephah, right, measurements. They have a cubit, right? They have, you know, a wine press. They have a threshing floor. They have all these things that you hear about in the Bible, and you're like, what is that exactly? And you see it, and you go, oh. And a threshing floor was always up really high. And the reason for that was a threshing floor needs wind to work. And what they would do is they would take what they had harvested, and they would throw it up in the air, and all the chaff, you know, the basically the, just the real life stuff, would blow away, and it would leave the grain. And a wine press was always very low. And so here we have Gideon in a wine press threshing 
the wheat. Why is he doing that? Because he doesn't want the Midianites to find him. Now, to some degree, you get it. They've been coming and stealing my stuff every year. Not this year. That guy runs by and gets my check every two weeks. I'll show him. (laughs) I'm going to put tax all over the floor. I'm going to figure something out, right? I'm going to find a way. And so Gideon is, now, right now, he's not a man of great faith. He's hiding. He's concerned about the enemy. Instead of crying out to the Lord, he's trying to figure out a way in his own strength to overcome the enemy. So the angel of the Lord comes when the people are starving, they're hiding, they're in bondage to the enemy, they could never defeat on their own, uh, just as he would a thousand years later. Orpah means dust, and Joash is one who despises or burns, and Abizite is father of help. And here Jesus came, and again, uh, the place known as dust, you know, from ashes to ashes, dust to dust, people in a place of despair. And Gideon means warrior, but he's not living up to it at the moment. Warriors don't hide down the wine press and try to, you know, shake a little weed up. Warriors go out and fight the enemy. So here we have Gideon threshing wheat, separating the wheat from the chaff, doing it in a place of fear and hiding. Verse, 20, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Has he done anything to be called a mighty man of valor yet? Isn't it good to know that God sees the finished product? Amen? The world loves to point out who you are in your worst moment. God sees the man or woman he's going to mold you into in the end. Aren't you glad? Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. And God is a faithful God. An odd greeting for a man of frailty and fear the Bible tells us that he who begins a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Amen? God's still working on me. How about you? And it's good to know that he hasn't given up. And he's molding us more and more to the image of his son. And some of that might come through trials, that we don't want to shake our fist at God in the midst of it. We want to praise him for it. And that's easier said than done. Can we say amen? It didn't seem like the Lord was with him. It didn't seem like he was a mighty man of valor. Gideon might have, I almost imagine Gideon when he says, mighty man of valor, Gideon going, someone behind me? I'll tell my wife. My wife, when my wife and I first met, she came into where I was working and she said something very complimentary to me and I literally turned around thinking she was talking to somebody else because I didn't see myself. She, well, I'll tell, she said, aren't you tall, dark, and incredibly good looking? That was obviously a long, that was obviously a long time ago. 40 years ago, you know, 30-something years ago. But, you know, you turn around, you're not talking about me. And can you imagine, here he is hiding out on the threshing floor, and the angel of the Lord co- comes to him and calls him, uh, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Hiding out, shaking the wheat. Mighty man of valor, not so much. God sees the man he was going to become. The word valor, they're man of wealth, man of virtue, man of strength. He's just the opposite. He's a frail, frail and feel fearful man, but that's the kind of man that God can use. Now watch how Gideon responds. Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Does that sound like the guy you want running the church? Is that the guy you want leading the army? Is that the guy you want coming down from Mount Sinai having talked to God? Is that the guy you want going into the Holy of Holies to speak with the Lord? Is that, this is the guy. This is the prophet. This is the man God's going to use, and God's not hiding his frailties. But look, all those things I said about, does God really care about us? Doesn't he say all of it right there in verse 13? He forsaken us. I thought he cared about us. Where's all the miracles we heard about? God's forsaken us, and the enemy's got us. And blah, blah, blah. Got a whole different, a little a different opinion to Gideon right about now. Amen. I was gonna name my son Gideon. I don't think so. <laughs> He's challenging God. Why is this happening? Why haven't you wiped out the enemy? Where are the miracles? He thought the problem was with God. 
Guys, the problem's never with God. It's always with us. Can we say amen to that? When we want to get mad at God, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. God never fails. God is always faithful. We're faithless. God is faithful. Amen? And here this mighty man, going to be a mighty man of God. God already sees him as a mighty man of valor. He sees the man that he's going to use next chapter to go out and fight a, a huge enemy with 300 men where he's going to become a man of faith. But you know what? He's going to have to go a few th- through a few things first. And guys, we say, God, mold me into a mighty woman of God or a mighty man of God. Well, guess what? If you want to be molded into a mighty man and woman of God, get ready for the trials because they're coming. Amen? Faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. It's a testing of our faith. It produces patience and molds us in the image of the Savior. Don't blame God. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. Notice that God's not even going to answer his questions. Because you ever, you ever had those questions and God doesn't answer? Because the question is just wrong. Amen? So point number one, does God really care? He cares enough to discipline us. He cares enough to give us his word. He cares enough to come down to us in person. Didn't Jesus leave heaven and come to earth and suffer and die that we might have eternal life? Can we say amen to that? Hasn't God come to us personally now in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, never leaves us nor forsakes us? Can we say amen to that? Point number two, does God know what he's doing? Almost sacrilegious to even ask that question. Notice what it says there. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and you save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you. You shall defeat the Midianites as one man. You know what's interesting? Gideon no doubt thought the Lord was either confused or out of his mind when he said he was a man of might. Because in Gideon's mind, he was a weak man. I'm a weak man. And my family is small. And I'm one of the smallest tribes of the tribe of Manasseh. And I got the smallest family amongst them. And we're a bunch of nobodies. And you know what? That's a person God can use. Amen? Now, we should not walk around like that once we recognize who we are in Christ. We should be humble, we should be broken, but we should also recognize he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And God can use me. Amen? So I'll have boldness to step out in faith, not in my strength, but in his. And Gideon is, I'm worthless. I'm of no value. I'm nothing. Doesn't that sound like a few other people God used in the Bible? Amen? Amen? Remember when he called Moses, what did Moses say? I'm, 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 I'm a stutterer. I, 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 I got not, I, Lord, no, I, you can't use me. And don't you love that God doesn't go out and get the biggest, buffest guy? He uses a teenager like David. He uses a, a cast-out former prince who's become a shepherd like Moses. Why does God do that? He uses fishermen and tax collectors to be his apostles. Why? Because it's not about us, it's about him. It's not who we are, it's who he is in us. It's not who we are, it's whose we are. It's who we belong to. So next time you're afraid to step out in faith, just remember, it's got nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. I'm just a tool in the hand of the master, amen? And so Gideon's in this place. The key to being used by God is not who you are, not how educated you are, not how eloquent you are, not what your pedigree is, but who he is. The best of us will fail, but God is faithful. And notice he says to him, I will be with you. Underline that in your Bible if that's your Bible. I will be with you. The only reason that we ever have victory, the only reason that our lives bear fruit, the only reason that anybody ever comes to know the Lord when we share our faith, the only reason we can stand for, a, you know, have a godly marriage and a godly home and a Christ-centered life, the only reason is because He is with us. Without Him, we can do nothing. 
but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God plus one man is enough. That's what he's telling him. I can do all this with you. I didn't pick the buffest guy, I picked you. The guy hiding, threshing in the floor, the guy murmuring, the guy that you don't think I care about you, you're the guy I'm going to use. You're a mighty man of valor because I know who you're going to become, not because of who you are. You're going to be a mighty man of value, not because you're going to get your act together, but because I'm going to be with you. That's what's going to make you a mighty man of valor. That means when you go to work tomorrow, you're a mighty man or a mighty woman of valor because God is with you. Amen? When you're interacting with an unbeliever, when you're sharing your faith, you're a mighty woman, mighty man. Why? Because God is with you. If you do it in your own strength, it'll be a mess. But if God is for us, who can be against us? God's assurance to Gideon was not to build up his self-confidence, but to assure him that God was indeed with him. Gideon did not need more self-confidence. He needed more God-confidence. Amen? You need to be more self-confident. I'm, I'm too self-confident. That's my problem. How about you? Anybody here besides me struggle with pride? Ever? Is that ever a problem for you? You hate it in other people. Amen? One of my, you know little side of your pastor. You know, there's those videos that come online, Buzz video, and there's the ones that I like to watch. Forgive me, okay? It shows your human side. Where there's a, it'll say, really arrogant guy gets knocked out. Oh, I gotta watch that. <laughs> and you got a fighter in the thing, and he's all arrogant beforehand, and he's just whooping it up, and, and I'm great. And when they start the fight, he's standing like, go ahead and hit me, and the guy hits him and knocks him out. Oh, pride goes before destruction. Amen? But you know what? I'm that guy sometimes. How about you? We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. We don't have confidence in ourselves. We have confidence in Him. Without Him, I can do nothing, but He's a great and an awesome God. It's important to know that God sent us to be even greater. It's even, be even greater to know that he's, He is with us. It's good to know He sent us. It's even greater to know that He's with us. And the same assurance that He gave Moses is now an assurance that He's given to Gideon. God's commandment is God enabling. God's called you, he'll equip you. You feel fr frail and weak, God would say, step out, I'll be with you. We have things we need, we, what I'd love to see happening in this fellowship. There, this community needs the Lord. There's so many things we can do for the kingdom of God, and too often it's because we're all afraid to get out of our comfort zone and step out. Ask God to show you what to do. Get out of your comfort zone, and let's live with reckless abandon for the Savior. Amen? And that's the exhortation we see here. Verse 17 and 18. Verse 16. Verse, yeah. The Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk to me. Okay, now I'm going to cut him some slack the first time he does this, even though he shouldn't have done it once. But at least he's going to say, okay, Lord, how do I know this is really from the Lord? So he's going to ask the Lord to show him that he's real, it's really from him. But So let's watch. God tells him, I'm with you. And kind of his response is, prove it. I don't just trust your word. Show me something. You know, the Bible says a perverse and wicked generation seeks after a sign. Amen? Now in this case, you know, a lot of the commentators... And I'm kind of there, believe, well, the first time, does he really know the power of the one who's talking to him fully? Maybe not. So he can cut him a little bit of slack. So watch what happens. It says there, do not depart from me, verse 18, pray until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before, to set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So he tells the Lord, doesn't now obviously not fully realizing who it is, Lord, wait here. I'm going to go prepare an offering, and I'll come back and bring it to you. The Lord says, okay, I'll wait. Verse 19, so Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket. He put broth in a pot. He brought, it, he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. Now, this is an act of some level of faith because they are in the midst of a what? A famine. Ephah of flour would probably feed his family for many days. A young goat produces milk. and I mean, that would have fed his family for weeks probably. And so he brings that out, and he brings it before the angel of the Lord, God's messenger. So Gideon seeks confirmation. Okay. 
And I do think that's good. We should seek confirmation and not just fly off the handle. Now, God's already told him what to do. And he sh- but, but for us, if you don't know if you've heard from the Lord, don't just be moved by your circumstances and don't just be moved by your emotions. Be led by the Holy Spirit and let the word of God confirm it. Can we say amen to that? I was driving through Arizona on the way back from my vacation and houses are a hundred grand down there. They got pools in their backyard. Let's move tomorrow. Guys, God may move you there, but make sure it's the Holy Spirit, not your circumstances. So confirmation from the Lord is a good thing. But if God's already told you, you don't need any more confirmation. Can we say amen to that? Talk about this more as we move on. So he does bring it out. It is interesting that he brings out flour, a goat, and then meat. Notice what it says here in verse 20 and 21. The angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, lay it on this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire arose out of the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Is that confirmation? When you put a stick on a rock and it bursts into flames, I'm thinking so. (laughs) Amen? And I love that it's a rock with unleavened bread, meat, broth. Remember they pour out, they they have offerings they pour out, right? They have offerings of meat that they burn, right? Burnt offerings. Unleavened bread is a picture of sinlessness. All of this is pointing to Jesus. Can we say amen to that? And he is the rock. I love this. Puts his staff upon it. He's the great high priest. Amen. So fire out of the rock. Jesus departs. And again, picture of the flesh, the unleavened bread poured out. I love these pictures. By the way, fire, God's presence, tongues of fire when the Holy Spirit came down. Amen. Amen. So I just love this picture. It's all pointing to the Lord. So Gideon finds confirmation, basically at a picture of what we would do at communion, at the Lord's table, looking back, looking within, looking forward, verse 22. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Hello! (laughs) I think that might have been somebody. I think that was an angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, peace be with you, do not fear, you shall not die. Man, that's some good stuff right there. You've had seven years of these people running over the top of you. They're taking all your food. They're wiping everybody out. You're hiding from them. And now you've seen the Lord face to face. He says, hey, I'm with you, and you're not going to die. You don't have to be afraid anymore. Now, it's one thing for God to tell you that, and it's another thing for you to live like it. Has God, not t- has God not told us that we are, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind? Can we say amen to that? Has God not told us to go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel? Has God not told us that we're the salt and the light, that we represent him? God has told us, has he told us he's going to provide for you? He's Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, our provider. Has he told us he's the great physician? Guys, we know those things to be true, but do we live like it? And that's the exhortation here. Gideon says, man, I've seen the Lord. Dude, fire. Ask for a sign? God gives him one. He's now an altered man because he spent time at the altar. Amen? You want to be altered? Get on your face at the altar. Amen? Spend time in the presence of the Lord. Seek his face. There's no other way to become an altered man or an altered woman than to spend time at the altar. He laid his sacrifice. Notice what it says here in verse 23 and or verse 24. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. To this day it is still in Oprah of the Abizrites. It's interesting that in the midst of war, he builds an altar and calls it the Lord is peace. Because, guys, when we have the Prince of Peace, it doesn't matter how much war is going on around us, we're at peace. The only peace that matters is that we're at peace with God. Amen? You can be in the middle of a war zone and be at peace with God, and you can be laying on the beach in the Bahamas and not be at peace with God. Amen? So it's having that right relationship with Him. So does God know what He's doing? Yeah. Because He called Him a mighty man of valor, and He was starting to wonder. 
And then he saw the power of God right before his eyes, and he's like, okay, he is who he says he is. So this should be enough from here on out. What do you think? Will God take care of me? Look at verse, point number three here. Look at verse 25 and 26. Now it came to pass on the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, and the second bull is seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that's beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer it as a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. Now, I believe you, Lord. I believe it. He is. Yes, I have confidence. I believe it. I want you to go and cut down your dad's altar. I want you to destroy all his false gods. And I want you to take two of his bulls in the midst of a famine. And I want you to go sacrifice them. I want you to take your dad's Maserati and drive it into a fence. I want you to take your dad's prized possessions, and then I want you to take the God that he worships and use it for firewood. It's one thing to say, yes, Lord, I trust you, and it's another thing to step out in faith. Amen? It's one thing to say, I believe, and it's another thing to live like it. So he challenges him. Gideon, go grab your dad's young bull, the one that's seven years old, full maturity, tear down his idols in his house. I want you to make a stand for me. Now, this goes to show you, we honor our mother and father until our mother and father tell us to dishonor God. Then we honor God. Can we say amen to that? So, what's Gideon going to do? Will God take care of me if I step out in faith? Will God watch over me? It's a moment of truth. Remember, Gideon's family is filled with Baal worshipers. And he's telling them, you need to turn your whole family around tonight. I want you, I want you, well, not tonight, I want you to tear it down. And I want you to not only tear it down, but replace it with an altar to the true and living God. Guys, it's not enough to rid your house of the ungodly. You need to put Jesus in its place. You say amen to that? Remember that story, the, you know, the demon-possessed man and you know, the, the demons came out, but he didn't replace it with the Lord, and they came back seven times stronger. Guys, not enough to get rid of the evil. We've got to replace it with the Lord. And so what's Gideon going to do? Then Gideon took ten men from among his servants. Now, first of all, did God say, I'm going to use you in ten men? Did he say, I'm going to be with you? Okay, so he goes and gets ten men. And did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household, the men of the city, too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Kind of wimpy. You know, it's kind of like the person says, I want to be bold for the Lord. And you're in a restaurant and you pray, but you make sure nobody knows you're praying. Dear Lord, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. I prayed. I did what God wanted me to do, but I did it so nobody would notice. Guys, I want to live out loud for the Lord, and I hope everybody notices. Not in fear, not, not, and again, not to bring focus to me, but to bring focus to him. So he does it. Now, he did it, but he did it under the cover of night. He was hiding in the cave when the Midianites came, and they're still kind of hiding out. They did it, but they were kind of afraid. And again, God had told him not to be afraid. The angel of the Lord Jesus had told him, don't be afraid. But you notice that God uses even the fearful. Doesn't that encourage you that God can use you? Amen? God even used a fearful man here. So imagine the scene the next morning when everybody wakes up. Look at verse 28. And when the men of the city rose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down, and the wooden image was beside it was cut down, and the second bowl was being offered at an altar which had been built. And they said to one another, Who did this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. You know what? He didn't do it with boldness. I have an idea one of the ten guys who went with him told. How else did they find out? He took some guys with him he shouldn't have taken and went at night when he shouldn't have gone during the day. And guess what? The result was the same. You could have done it in the noonday sun and obeyed God. 
Instead, he does it in the cover of dark. And guess what? The very thing he feared he was still going to have to face. The men were fired up because Gideon had obeyed the Lord and done something that no other man had done. How long has that altar been sitting there? Didn't they, weren't they told? Didn't Joshua tell them, wipe out the idols? Didn't they, wasn't it read to them? The last 20 chapters of Deuteronomy, when you get there, destroy the idols. Not one man has stood up. Praise God that Gideon stood up. It took some prodding and he did it at night, but at least he did it. You know, Peter stepped out of the boat, but he sank. At least he got out of the boat. Amen? So Gideon, shown some level of faith, and the word came quick that it was Gideon. And guys, if you stand for God, the word's going to get out. And I hope it does. Amen? Hope it does. Now watch. Then the men of the city said, Joash, bring your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. Now, verse 31 is awesome. Because Joash is the father of Gideon, and it was his altar, and his stuff that was burnt on the altar, and it would have been so easy for him to go, you're right, my son's a knucklehead, get him out there, he stole my bulls on top of it, set him on fire. But you know what? The boldness, even though it was in, dark, in the dark, of his son is going to impact his father. And do you know when you make a stand for the Lord, it impacts those around you? Amen? Nobody else had stood up all this time. Even though Gideon didn't do it as fearlessly as he could, at least he did it. And now it's going to bring faith into his father. Look at verse 31. But Joash said, to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. Hey, if, if Baal's a god, let, let Baal bring the revenge. If Baal's real, let Baal be the one to stand up for himself. His image was knocked down. Let's see him set himself back up. He was the one that was torn down. Let's let him respond. Elijah did the same thing with the prophets of Baal. You remember that? You guys dance around, call down fire, and let's see what happens. And then I'll call on the true and living God, and we'll find out who God is. And the prophets of Baal marched around and wounded themselves, and no fire came. And it's the first time, I think it's the first time there's taunting in human history. Because Elijah is just mocking Baal. Where's your God? Certainly he is a God. Maybe he's out hunting. Maybe he's in the bathroom. It's in the Bible. Taking care of his necessities, it says in the Bible. So Joash wasn't angry that the bulls were taken. He stirred up by his own sons uh, stepping out in faith. And it says there, Therefore on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he has torn down his altar. Jerubbabel means contender or challenger of Baal. Don't be afraid of what your family might think. Be bold. Don't be afraid of what the world may, how the world may curse you. Be bold. When I was in Santa Cruz, we had a lot of witchcraft and New Age movement and all this other nonsense. The Church of Satan was down the street. And I had a few times where we people call and they said they're placing a curse on us. Bring it. Stop it already. We're putting two sticks out in front. We're cursing you. Come on, bring it. My God is greater. God is for me who can be against me. Amen? And so there was a similar event that happened. I love this. During a great move of God in the South Seas in the 19th century, one tribal chief was converted to Christianity. He gathered up the idols of his people and he told the idols he was going to destroy them, then gave them a chance to run away. He gathered up all their idols, lined them up around the fire in front of all of his people and said, okay, I'm going to burn you all up. You got a chance to run. Go. And when they didn't run, he picked them all up and threw them in the fire and nobody could say anything. He said, what kind of God do you have? He couldn't even get away. Amen. 
But the reality is we look at those gods and it's so easily foolish to us. But people serve the gods of fame today and the gods of money and the gods of pleasure. And they pursue them and we praise them. We want the autograph of somebody who pursues pleasure and money. And, you know, we, we watch their shows and we, we, we get involved with their entertainment and all the nonsense they're doing. And we even look up to them. Oh, did you see so-and-so who seeks pleasure and denies the true and living God? I got their name on a scrap of paper. I'm so excited. It's no different than the gods of Baal. Amen? The gods of pleasure, the gods of sex, the gods of money, the gods of fame. It's nauseating. Lord, help us not to be entertained by the very sins Christ died for. Amen? So though Gideon, though fearful, obeyed. And God not only protected him from the angry crowd, his dad was touched by his action and it changed his heart. When you step out in faith, it's always worth it. It's not always easy, but it's always worth it. Amen? Doing what is easy is rarely right, and doing what is right is rarely easy. Amen? Stepping out in faith. Let's finish up. Last point. Does God keep his promises? So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. As you have said, God, you already told me you were going to do it. I need another sign to prove it. Guys, putting out a fleece is not an act of faith. It's an act of faithlessness. Amen? Some of you are going to disagree with me. Did he already tell him he was going to give him victory? What's the answer? Did he already show him when he brought fire down out of a stick and burned up everything? God already told him to go. I need another. I need some more help here. I don't need a magic, okay, God, I know you told me to go magic eight ball. Do it. I don't need that. I trust God and his word. Amen? I'm going to put out a fleece as to whether or not I should continue dating this unbeliever. No! Bible already said no. Amen? Gideon already been told, I'm going to be with you. You're a mighty man of valor. I'm going to give you victory. Um, show me one more time. Now watch what happens. God is so gracious. And it was when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, uh, don't be angry with me, but let me speak just one more time. Let me test, I pray, just one more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and all the ground around it be, there be dew. It's almost like he wants it not to, you know, God, I already did the altar thing. Fighting the Midianites? Could you get somebody else? God calls you to do something, and you're looking for every reason not to do it. God has already clearly commanded it. By the way, spying out the land, I hear that too. I'm going to go spy out the land. I think that's also faithless. God had told him to go into the land. You don't need to spy it out. He said, go. Yes, Lord. God already told him he's going to give him victory. Let me try that fleece thing one more time. Faithless. But look at the patience of God. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground. The Spirit of the Lord had come upon Gideon. And this follows a familiar pattern of Spirit's work upon men in the Old Covenant. The Holy Spirit comes upon them for a specific reason. And we're going to see God do a great and an awesome work in the hearts of the children of Israel. We're going to see God do great and awesome things as they step out in faith and are used by the Lord. I skipped over verse 34. Go back to that. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet, and they gathered behind him. You know, that's, this is what has happened here is that the Holy Spirit has already come upon him, but he's still testing the Lord. And guys, when the Holy Spirit has come upon us, we shouldn't have to test God anymore. Can we say amen to that? Sorry that I skipped that verse. I don't even know how that happened. And yet, so he, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, God has his hand upon him. He's standing for God. He's tearing down uh, the false idols. His dad's been impacted. The Spirit of God is upon him. His faith, though limited, had served to stir up. And we're going to see 32,000 more are going to join him in battle when we get to the next chapter. Gideon's still hesitant. How many of you can relate to him? You know God's got a calling on your life, but it's still kind of scary. Can we say amen to that? 
We know that God wants to do more with us, but it's so easy just to stay comfortable. So, from doubter to deliverer, does God really care about us? He does. Enough to discipline us, enough to give us his word, enough to come down to us personally. Does God know what he's doing? Of course he does. He chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Uh, will God take care of me? Uh, when we fearfully step out in faith, God will protect and provide for us. Our lives will bear fruit. And does God keep his promise? Yes, even when we're faithless. Gideon was being faithless, and God continued to keep his promises. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for everyone's patience tonight. So we covered a lot of ground. Lord, I just ask in Jesus' name that we would learn from Gideon's example. Lord, to step out even when we're afraid. And Lord, we're thankful that you see the finished product. You don't see us in our worst moment. You see the men and women you're going to mold us into, that you're going to be faithful to complete that work. And so, Lord, I pray you stir us up by your spirit to get out of our comfort zones and to minister to a lost and a dying world, to reach out to them by faith. Lord, help us not to have a spirit of fear. May we not be bold in ourselves, but confident in you. We ask these things in your holy and your precious name we pray, and all God's people said... Let's stand up and worship.